in the book Bike Man, you tell your personal account of 9-11. How has this moment in time changed the essence of how you report? How I report? It's interesting. It's an interesting question because as a reporter, you stand aside from things. Uh, you don't get involved. <clears throat> and you try to gather up the information as pure as fact as you can and present it as pure as fact as you can, unfiltered as much as you can. And you, you learn how to do that over time. But this was different. Uh, I couldn't divorce myself from what was happening there. It was too powerful, too painful. And I don't know if it changed me because I think I flipped right back to being a reporter. Uh, but it may have. It, it may have. If, if it has at all uh, allowed me to become more involved in the stories I'm reporting, it's not very much. I mean, I, I think if, if a good example would be Haiti. That was a pretty, pretty much a straightforward report without uh, getting too emotionally involved myself. All right. Being a journalist that day in New York City, how does one cope with what had just happened and bring themselves to go back into the chaos? Um, I still get the willies in certain uh, circumstances. CBS is located on West 57th Street, <clears throat> and I was walking from the subway toward the broadcast center one day, a year or two later. <clears throat> Some people were uh, looking up and pointing and hollering, and I assumed, but didn't look, that there was a jumper uh, threatening to jump, or the potential jumper. And it all came flooding back, and I started getting, my knees started getting wobbly, and I walked all the way around three blocks to avoid passing that. And another time, a jet came roaring over the city in the wrong way. And here again, uh, I started feeling the same fears that I had that day. But by and large, it, it doesn't affect you on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't think. Describe the strongest image from 9-11 that continues to haunt your memory. Um, probably the worst of it is the people who were jumping from the building uh, to their deaths. Uh, that, that's the most haunting image that I have. Do, um, I know they, they ran pictures of people actually jumping from these buildings. Do you feel like it was wrong for them to do that and actually publish them? Oh, I don't know. It depends. I, mean, I think if it was gratuitous, if it was just a wallpaper to show, you know, this was happening. If there was a specific story involving that particular person, involving that particular uh, issue of some sort, then in, in a specific way I can see using it. A friend of mine wrote a book on the photography of 9-11, uh, the pictures and the photographers of 9-11. And in that he has a very close-up detailed picture of a person head down falling to his death. And it's jarring as all get out. But it's not objectionable in the context that he was using it. So to use it gratuitously like anything used gratuitously, that would be a mistake. Considering the trauma of what you've been in contact with, what would you have done differently that day when you left downtown towards the World Trade Center? <laughs> I probably wouldn't do anything differently. I'd probably done the same thing. Uh, what you're asking is, knowing what I know now that I went through, would I still go down there? I did, yeah, I probably would. <laughs> yeah. So it's like being in journalism. Yeah, yeah, you run toward the danger. In your book, you write, survival is an absence of death, describing it as a middle place between now and forever. Can one ever leave that place in his or her soul? No. No. There's so many things about getting out of there alive that do affect you. <clears throat> and one of them is a, a survivor's guilt. There was a fellow, it's not in the book, but there was a fellow who was running w with our little pod of people as the building was collapsing on top of us. And uh, he disappeared under an enormous, you know how 
big those buildings were. Well, the pieces of the walls of that were just as big. And he just disappeared underneath it. And it, it's, you know, I still think about why him, you know? How, why is it that that piece fell on him and not on me? So, yeah, that sort of thing. It is noted that a lot of your style and form for Bite Man is reflective of Dante's Inferno. Right. What comparisons and parallels can be made between the two? Well, I mean, the obvious uh, stylistic thing is it's written in cantos, which in basically are chapters in a poem. Um, beyond that is the story and the story form. One of the things that I liked about the storytelling in Dante's Inferno was it was first person present tense. It gives you an immediacy and a shared experience. If, it's, if you read it that way, first person, present tense, you are there as the reader. Although you know you're not there, but you are experiencing it very much as if you are there. Um, and of course, overall, we each uh, gave our version of uh, travels through hell and back. So that parallel exists as well. Why did you choose this style for writing your book? Well, I explained this today. Um, I was rereading Dante's Inferno as I revisited the notes that I'd taken uh, when, right after the morning. I, during the morning, I rewrote. I wrote all of the notes of what had happened to me. I pulled them out three or four years later. At the same time, I was reading Dante's Inferno, and they worked together. And so that's how it. it believe me, I didn't set out to write an epic poem. How were you introduced into uh, Dante's Inferno? I'd read it school? in uh, high school. In high school, really? Yeah, yeah. Read it in high school, and uh, I hadn't read it in a long time, and so I had it was on the shelf, and I just happened to say, "Well, I, you know, I didn't have any books on the on the end table. I'd been I'd read through everything I'd wanted to, so I just happened to pull it out. So it was total kismet." Um. Finally, how important are poetic devices in journalism, especially as the game is changing. Oh, well, I don't think it, it affects, the, the changes in the game don't affect good writing. And I think the poetic devices that you can use, and you, remember, you're not writing poetry, but you are using uh, devices that help bring the story to the viewer, or the listener, or the reader. <coughs> so metaphors are a great way to explain, and in this piece I did uh, for the Dan Rather Reports, they have cut in Haiti, they cut uh, an uplift uh, uh, from the sea bottom that is now in a little island, a coral reef, and so it's dying. So they cut a whole slice of it, uh, a paleo seismologist, which means she studies uh, ancient uh, earthquakes. So what she's going to do is read that slab, its side, going back centuries and centuries and centuries, and through the reading of that, she's going to be able to see if there were earthquakes before and how they can date that, carbon date things, and so they will know how many years ago there was an earthquake and so on, and maybe build a little history and say, well, we can anticipate one in another 250 years or whatever. But the way I describe that is that she will read it the way uh, people read the rings of a tree. Now, everybody knows that. Everybody knows how to read the rings of a tree. It's something that you grew up learning. But they might not understand how she reads uh, a slab of coral. That enlightened what she was doing. And it's a sweet analogy. It's pleasant. Writing like that is pleasant to hear, if it's not difficult to write. But that's a good example of uh, using metaphor. All right, well, that concludes our interview. And okay. Thank you for your time today. You're very Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Thanks for coming to the Thank you. reading. And I've got a scamper. Yes, we <laughs> know.